Tenlil Khalifa and Iron Age Caravan Sarad. Camel caravans probably started traversing the ancient Near East about 1000 BCE. And caravan sarais were very important for their success. They were like truck stops in the ancient inner states. Caravans sarai have been documented since the Roman period. Pliny the Elder, for example, described the Roman incense trade route from South Arabia up to Gaza. He said that it consisted of 65 stages with a station at the end of each one, in other words, a caravan sarai. Caravan sarai probably go back to the Iron Age, but only a few sites have actually been identified as possible caravan sarai. One of them is Tel El Khalifa. It's situated, Tel El Khalifa also sits at the crossroads of major ancient trade routes, which is another reason to believe it was a caravan sarai. So let's look at Tel El Khalifa. Nelson Gluck, the biblical archaeologist, excavated it over three field seasons, 1938, 39, and 1940. He recorded end of season reports for all three seasons. And he also wrote short articles about Tel El Khalifa, but he never wrote a final report. He died before he got to it. However, his archive is well cared for, but divided between three institutions, Harvard, the Smithsonian, and the Jordan Archaeological Museum. In the 1980s, Gary Pratico took up Tel El Khalifa as his dissertation project. In 1993, he published it as a book. He calls it a reappraisal. It's a it's chronology based on the ceramics. Pratico dated the site to the late eighth into the sixth century BC. And this is the site at the end of the 1939 field season. This is Gluck's general map of the site. He divided the occupation into five phases, but Pratico rejected those. He said phasing was not possible given Gluck's poor data. The problem was his excavation and recording methods. Pratico proposed instead two phases of architecture based on the size of the bricks. The first one is the casemate fortress. At some point it was destroyed and abandoned. It was followed by a fortified settlement. Let's look at how Tello Khalifa might have functioned as a caravanserai. The architecture, says Caravan Sarai, it shares features that are seen and known later Caravan Sarai. A large fortification wall, a large open court, and small chambers around the periphery. The wall at Khalifa was enormous, three meters thick, and the gate was monumental. And these features provided security for the caravans. And this was important. The trade routes were dangerous. The caravans carried very precious goods and they were often robbed. The large open court was a place for animals to stay safely at night. Caravans could also be received here and the traders could unload their cargo. The small rooms along the side provided lodging and also a safe place to store cargo. I can imagine they look something like this. Caravans um, had to provide other necessities. One of the most important, water. 
The air around Khalifa is very dry, but the water table near the coast is shallow. At Khalifa, it may have only been about two meters below the surface, so it would have been easy to dig a well and draw water out with a shaduf like this farmer. Gluck found no evidence of wells and no evidence of water installations, but he didn't look for them. However, he did recover archaeological evidence of other necessities. He collected plant remains, which was very unusual for his time. And this is a sample of the collection, which is stored at Harvard. And I'm currently working on it. It includes plant foods. The most important, probably the grains, barley and emmer wheat. And these would have been imported probably from communities to the north. They would have been prepared most likely as bread, like these barley flatbreads, and baked in these round installations. Gluck called these haras, but they're actually tanurs. Tanurs are cylindrical ovens. They've been used in the Middle East since the Neolithic, and they're still used today. The, the dough is baked on the sides of the, um, of the cylinder. Gluck found tenors in various places throughout the site, mostly as a single tenor in a room or two tenors. And this is what you'd expect in a household. A family wouldn't need any more than one or two. But there were places like this area where he found multiples in rooms, and I would call those bakeries. And let's just take a look. In room 49, Gluck found the remains of eight or nine tenors. Now, it's possible that they're not from the same period, but it seems unlikely if they, these were being rebuilt they would not be scattered around the room this way. So I think it's more likely that this actually was a bakery. Gluck also found multiple tenors in room 45 and also in room 36. He also found dates and he found animal bones. They're stored at the Smithsonian and have not yet been studied, unfortunately. I believe the people of Khalifa, I'll call them Khalifis, obtained meat from local pastoralists. It was probably goats. Goats are better adapted uh, for this dry environment than sheep or especially cattle. But fish were probably more important than meat. Gluck found good evidence for fishing, five copper fish hooks and lots and lots of fragments of fish hooks. Also, fish vertebrae here in the drawer at the Smithsonian. And notice how large these are. These fish would probably have been taken by spear fishing. And Gluck found fragments of tridents from spears. Fish and meat were most likely cooked in stews. It's the most efficient way to cook for a crowd. Like in this example, this is the end of season feast for the workmen who were with Ancient Egypt Research Associates at Giza last March. Note the size of that kettle. Let's look at the Khalifa pottery to see if there's anything comparable. These are Edomite cooking pots and some of them are pretty large. This one especially is as much as 44 meters wide. So possibly that might have been used to cook for a crowd, such as traders. There were lots and lots of cups and bowls, which also suggests that they may have been feeding large groups rather than just families. 
caravanserai also had to provide provisions because the traders could never have carried everything they needed for the whole duration of their trip. They would have needed travel food and dried bread would have been good for that. Uh, this Egyptian bread is first baked and then it's air dried and it'll last for three weeks. Dates were an excellent travel food. They last for a long time. They don't require any preparation and they're loaded with calories. The dome palm fruit was probably used as a travel food also. Inside the fruits are these big hard seeds. Gluck found 40 of them in fragments and they seem to be pretty common at this site because he mentions them um, in a number of different locations in his dig diary. The edible portion of the dome palm fruit is the husk around the outside. It can be ground into a powder and in that form it makes a good travel food. It just needs to be added to water for a nice beverage. Dried fish were also a good travel food. Traders probably needed to buy cordage to replace rope that was broken or worn out during their journey. Rope was essential for all aspects of the caravan, to tie the camels together, to tie on the load, and for the camel gear. Look found beautiful examples of cordage at Khalifa. This is made of palm fibers. And notice these two ropes they're really quite substantial, two and a half meters in diameter. Traders may have needed to buy fabric in order to repair or replace clothing that became torn or threadbare during their long journey. Khalifa produced ample evidence of a spinning and weaving industry. This is Gluck's photo of large collection of spindle whorls, and the one on the left is one that's in storage at the Smithsonian. We even have the products of spinning, these beautiful spun fiber bundles all set for weaving. They look just like the products of contemporary spinners. We also have evidence of weaving in the form of these weaving tools in the Smithsonian collection. How did traders pay for food, lodging, and provisions? We have weights, inscribed weights, and five bronze weights. These suggest trade activities. Were they used to weigh goods that paid for necessities? Did they weigh the necessities? that traders bought? Were they used to pay for tax tribute? It's hard to say, but they do suggest trade activities. Summing up, Khalifa certainly looks like a caravanserai. It was at the crossroads of ancient trade routes. It has a caravanserai layout. I tried to suggest using the archeological evidence how the Khalifis might have catered to caravan Sarai. Were they producing goods for traders or does the archeological evidence simply reflect ordinary household activities? To answer this, we need a new excavation 